Good afternoon. I'm going to call to order this meeting of the Housing Policy and Development Committee. This is our regular meeting of October 24th. Uh, my name is Cam Gordon. I'm chair of the committee, and I'm joined today by Vice Chair Jeremiah Ellison. Good timing. And also Council Members Reich, Goodman, Bender, and Schrader. This is a our full committee is here, and that's definitely a quorum of the committee. We have a number of public hearings today, which are all land sales. We have two consent items, and then we have three discussion items. I think what I'm going to do first is uh, move the consent agenda. Um, but I'm also going to pull one of it for an amendment. Um, the consent items is, um, include two. The first is the Department of Housing and Urban Development Home Program Neighborhood Stabilization Appropriations. There's three appropriations listed on the agenda. Uh, the second uh, consent item, which is the ninth item on the printed agenda, is our 2018 Emergency Solutions Grant Capital Funding Recommendations. This item was carried over from the last committee so that we could have some discussions about making a possible change to the staff recommendation and I would like to move a change to the staff recommendation. This would be approving an award of ESG funding in the amount of up to $299,212 to Salvation Army for capital improvements at Harbor Lights. That's the same as the staff recommendation but then the second portion would be to um, add an award in the amount of up to 99438 to the Bridge for Youth for capital improvements at the Bridge for Youth facility to support the expansion of services to pregnant and parenting youth experiencing homelessness. I'll move those both as consent, but we can certainly discuss either of them if anybody wants to. Seeing no discussion then, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. Those motions carry. Now let's move on to our uh, land sale public hearings. And I think we're going to take the first few as a one presentation. There's one buyer for the first four properties. Um, so we'll take that report and take that public hearing, those public hearings together. Uh. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. As, as you just stated, we do have the first four items um, for one buyer. That's 3418, 3543. 3635 and 3638, all on Girard Avenue North. Uh, for the sale through the Minneapolis Homes policies for the program were established by the City Council on December 11, 2015. And again, on February 10, 2017, the staff recommends the sale of 3418, 3543, 3635, and 3638 Girard Avenue North to the Greater Metropolitan Housing Corporation, also known as Gimmick for the appraised values of $7,600 dollars $7, and $7,600 respectively, subject to conditions. Staff has continuously marketed these properties to an email list serve of now over 2,400 recipients, and these are the only offers received for these properties. The purchaser has secured a $4 million in new markets tax credits to invest in building the first of 10 new single-family homes to be marketed exclusively to owner-occupants. CPET's construction management staff has reviewed the scope of work and estimates submitted by the applicant's builder and confirmed that they are sufficient to meet the minimum construction standards of the program. Notification was provided to the Fowl Neighborhood Association on August 6, 2018. Uh, Eden Spencer from the Greater Met from Gimmick is here today. Are there any questions? I don't see any questions. Okay. I'd also like to acknowledge that Councilmember Fletcher is here. Thanks for being here. Um, I'll open the public hearing then on these uh, items. This is one through four. Is there anybody here who'd like to speak to the committee? Seeing no one then. I think she might be shy. That's okay. <laughs> it's not necessary, but it would be great if you could maybe tell us what you're going to do with the properties and yeah. who you hope to sell them to. And for Hi, I'm Eden Spencer with the Greater Metropolitan Housing Corporation. And um, like Matthew mentioned, we were awarded $4 million in new market tax credits from a national organization called Housing Partnership Network. So it's going to allow us to do um, actually 11 projects in North Minneapolis. We own one of the lots. And our goal is to do a variety of different owner-occupant housing styles. So um, a mixture of different bedrooms from about two to four, um, two stories, one stories, all following our typical Minnesota Green Communities criteria, Energy Star um, certification, um, kind of a, a variety of opportunities that'll be available 
for new owners next, uh, probably for summer and fall. So, yep. So thank you uh, to the committee for your consideration. Thank you, I have one question. Um, do you know what kind of asking price you're looking at? You're so for the different housing types, it's gonna kind of vary and we're hoping to have houses kind of between $220,000 and about $250,000 is what we're kind of thinking for a resale price. Well, excellent, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And this is a public hearing, so if somebody else wants to come up and speak, they can approach the podium and introduce themselves as your name and address. Hi, my name's Kitty Stratton at 3519 DuPont Avenue North, and I'm on the Fallow Neighborhood Housing Committee along with Mary Lynn. And our concerns on these properties is that they may meet Energy Star, but if you look at some of the new um, research out, that if you take them to net zero through not only um, super energy efficiency, but it only adds three to four percent of the cost. Rocky Mountain Institute just uh, brought out that whole data analysis as far as upgrades. Energy Star is barely above housing code, and housing code, uh, building code is the crappiest house you can build, so Energy Star is slightly above that. I happen to live in a Green Homes North house that's net zero by design, and it's more than possible if these houses are going to sell for 220 to be able to incorporate those design features. I have had conversations with um, Kurt Bennett at GMAC, I mean at Gimmick, and um, <clears throat> because of the short deadline, it's still really possible. I've submitted a lot of information. And I think that if the city council pushed this, from your perspective, I can supply all the documentation you need to see that this really works. And what it does for me is at the end of the year, I actually make money on my uh, energy costs of about $350. So it gives me and my partner an average of $200 a month towards other resources. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the second thing is the range of costs from 220 to 250 in the Falwell neighborhood People are looking for houses in the 150s, and I really think that this is possible, especially in the two bedroom, two bath models, but 220 is not affordable in Falwell Neighborhood Association with an average income of $43,000. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming here and sharing those thoughts. Very, very interesting, intriguing. Is there anybody else who would like to speak at the public hearing? Welcome. My name is Mary Lind and I live at 3610 Emerson Avenue North. I'm, as she said, I'm on the Fowell um, Neighborhood Committee for Housing. And um, I've been in her house. It's beautiful, it's efficient. It, um, and um, if we're looking at affordable housing through these things, through these lots and these grant, I mean, these credits, I think it's really wise and would be incumbent to you to um, hear kind of some of the housing um, savings that she can save to make housing more affordable in North Minneapolis in the Fowl neighborhood. I think just 220 to $250,000 a year. I'm a resident of 15 years in Fowell, so I, I know the neighborhood. I've also been on the board. Um, and it just seems kind of really high for our neighborhood if we're trying to make these affordable housing. But may, you know, affordable housing, I just think that she's got really great ideas on how to um, save in energy that have, can make these homes more affordable, that, that should be considered. So I wanna encourage that. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who has any comments to make? Seeing none, then I'll close the public hearing. Uh, any council members want to make a motion or have any discussion on this? Council Member Goodman. Thank you. I move approval of the staff recommendation. Thank you very much. Any comments on the motion? Well, I really appreciate the comments, and hopefully we can keep pushing ourselves to be more energy efficient and also lower the cost of some of these houses. I also really appreciate that we're getting these um, properties moved back into circulation to provide some housing. There might even be an opportunity to have conversations between now and when they're built. I hope that does happen. Um, oh, Councilman Ellison. 
I do want to say that I appreciate the comments from neighbors, and while I don't want to hamper or hinder the these 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 properties from getting activated, and I think it's really important. I think it's uh, there are a lot of uh, vacant lots and properties that need repair in North Minneapolis, and uh, and so I'd I'd be happy. I know I'm not your representative, but I'd be happy to engage. Uh, you know, because I'm not I'm just not privy to some of the things that you're talking about. Uh, I would be happy to engage to see. How can we start to kind of like you know bake in better energy efficiency or or, or anything like that uh, as we have a lot to go uh, and I don't again but I don't want to uh, hinder the, the the activation of these of these sites so appreciate that I think that may express the sentiment of the committee generally um, then on the uh, motion all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. any opposed say no uh, that motion carries then and now we have another series of land sales and I think we'll have to. Uh, Take these maybe one at a time quickly and go through the list. Welcome back, Mr. Ramadan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Our first is our first of our um, rehab land sales. Uh, this one is uh, 4901 Vincent Avenue North. Um, again, this is staff recommending the sale of 4901 Vincent Avenue North to Harvest Management Group, LLC, for its appraised value of 16,400, subject to conditions. Additionally, approving the award of up to 20,000 in home buyer incentive funds to an eligible borrower as defined by the Minneapolis Homes Build a Rehab Manual. 4901 Vincent Avenue North was acquired on May 18, 2017 from Hennepin County as tax forfeited land for $1. The staff marketed this property with an open house held in June 2018 with the notification sent to a list of now over 2,400 people. There were two applications received, the other applicant being CTW Group However, CTW Group was deemed as unresponsive because it's proposed only minor rehab to a severely dilapidated structure. The purchaser proposes to invest $272,800 to demolish this dilapidated one bedroom, one bathroom, single family structure and build a new three, uh, excuse me, 3,125 square foot, which is 2,200 square feet of finished space, single family home with five bedrooms and two baths and two and a half baths to be sold to a pre-approved eligible homeowner. CPAD's construction management staff reviewed the scope of work and estimates submitted by the applicant and confirmed that they are sufficient to meet the minimum rehabilitation standards of the program. Notification was provided to the Shingle Creek Neighborhood Association on July 13, 2018. On August 22, 2018, the neighborhood notified staff that they were in support of the Harvest Management Group proposal. Uh, Denise King, the developer for Harvest Management Group, is here today. Are there any questions? I don't see any questions. Okay. Thank you very much for that report. Then I will open the public hearing in case the, uh, someone wants to tell us more about the project. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Denise King. I'll be the developer on this project. And um, as Mr. Ramadan had mentioned, I met with the Shingle Creek Association during the summer to review plans, we went through the architectural drawings that I have. They did have some concerns in regards to the size of the house since a lot of the homes in that area are one to one and a half story. Um, so I told them that as we move forward, I would definitely take their considerations or their um, concerns into the plans and propose to go back to the group uh, with the final designs to make sure that it is um, kind of, is a, um, kind of a agreement in regards to um, adding to the neighborhood and making sure that it fits within the um, structures that are currently there. And you already have a buyer for the home? Yes, I do. I am a, a licensed realtor and I do have a buyer for the home. Okay. Well, hopefully they'll be happy with the, any changes to the design as well. Yep. And we'll work with them as well through the entire process. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being sure. here. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak about this property sale seeing no one coming forward then i'll close this public hearing i'll uh, entertain a motion on this or any questions that committee members have councilman wilson uh, i'd be happy to move approval of uh, uh this item all right uh, any uh, comments or questions on that seeing none then all those in favor please say aye, aye. Uh, any opposed say no uh, that motion carries and next we have the land sale at 812 36th Avenue North. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, 812 36th Avenue North. Uh, staff is recommending the sale of this property to Jenny Investments LLC for its appraised value of $7,500. Subject to conditions, 
And if Jenny Investments fails to close, approving the sale of the property to Quain Investment LLC for $7,500 subject to conditions. It was a, this property was acquired on March 23rd, 2018 from Hennepin County's tax forfeited land for $1. We marketed this to now over 2,400 in our listserv with an open house held in June of 2018. There were actually five applicants who uh, proposed to build on this. Besides um, the two recommended, there were CTW Group, Northeast Minneapolis Properties LLC, and XVH Enterprise LLC. However, Jenny Investments and Queen Investments are the two highest ranked because of their greater experience and quality of completed projects. The purchaser proposes to invest 195,200 to rehab and construct an additional 400 square feet of finished living space to the property. Uh, the proposed single family project will have four bedrooms and three baths with an attached garage to be marketed exclusively to owner occupants. The alternate purchaser proposed to invest 103850 to rehab the property as a two bedroom, one bath single family home with a detached garage to be marketed exclusively to owner occupants. Our construction management staff has reviewed both proposals and confirmed they are sufficient to meet the minimum rehabilitation standards. Uh, notification was provided to the McKinley neighborhood on July 13, 2018. Jennifer Currier was here earlier today, but she had to leave to get back to another project. You may remember her as recently having two completed rehabs um, in about five months that she did. Um, and she's been one of our superstars, and, and if you've seen in our CPED newsletter too, uh, really a great production for us. Unfortunately, like I said, she had to leave to get back to a project, and so she's not able to be here today. Are there any questions for me, though? I do not see any questions. Okay. And I may not expect anyone at the public hearing then because uh, she had to leave, but I will open it. Uh, does anybody wish to speak about this land sale? Seeing no one come forward then, I'll close the public hearing and entertain a motion from any committee members. Council Member Ellison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd be happy to move uh, approval of the sale. Any comments or questions on that motion? Seeing none then, all those in favor, please say aye. Any opposed say no. That motion carries. Now we'll move on to our next land sale, and this is of 3557 Logan Avenue North. Mr. Chairman, the committee. Um, this one actually was the alternate purchaser on our previous one, but now we're recommending 3257 Logan Avenue North uh, to be sold to Queen Investment LLC for $22,000 subject to conditions. If Queen Investment fails to close, uh, to sell to XVH Enterprise LLC for 22,000 subject conditions. Uh, this property was acquired on January 17, 2017 from Hennepin County as tax forfeited prop uh, land for $22,000. We marketed this over to over 2,400 people with an uh, open house in two June of 2018. There were three applications received, the other one being CTW Group. Uh, the purchaser proposes to invest 140800 to re rehab the property as a two-bedroom, one-bathroom, single-family home with a detached garage to be marketed exclusively to owner-occupants. The alternate purchaser proposes to invest 150, which is slightly higher. Uh, unfortunately, uh, their, their um, financing was kind of tight, so we believe that they would be more suitable to be an alternate rather than um, the, the, the main purchaser. Uh, CPS Construction Management Group reviewed the work, scope of work and estimates submitted and confirmed that they were sufficient to meet the minimum rehabilitation standards of the program. Notification was provided to the McKinley Neighbor Association, excuse me, the Fowler Neighbor Association on July 13, 2018. And the developer, Mihai Muscovici, is here today. Are there any questions of us? I don't see any questions. Um, okay. Thank you very much. I'll open the public hearing then for this item, the land sale at 3257 Logan Avenue North. Is anybody here to speak on this? Perhaps somebody from Quaint Investment? Okay, well, we've got two people. Yep, you can go next after this gentleman. You can stand in line and wait or be, but yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, dear council, uh, I'm Mikhail Moskovich. I'm the representative of the Quaint Investment. Uh, thank you for uh, this opportunity to rehab yet another project in North Minneapolis, and uh, we're a small company, and uh, it's really our uh, um, yet next another project, and uh, we're happy to take it and uh, um, just uh, provide uh, a good, new-looking and uh, efficient house for the community. 
Are there any questions for me or about our company? I don't see any questions up here. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, and we have another speaker. Welcome back. Uh, again, my concerns are when I hear minimum standards. I was a plans examiner for the city for a while, and I understand what minimum standards are. Going forward and looking out into the future, these houses at, at meeting minimum standards now in 10 years will be in the condition that they were before. It takes very little to do more than minimum, and it and the end result is that in 10 years, the neighborhood, my neighborhood will not look like it did in the last 10 years. So more needs to be done. And you guys have the ability to dictate that. They're using your money and you really have the ability to dictate that. And it's very, very, very easy. I appreciate that. Anybody else wish to speak on this item? I don't see anyone. Then I'll close the public hearing. Um, and I think there probably is an opportunity in the future to look at what the standards are in the program and how it's working, especially in terms of energy efficiency and expectations. I'm also curious about looking at what the housing sales are in the end. I know that we've had concerns about this in the past. It was brought up today. Are we um, contributing to displacement from the neighborhood because of the expense of the houses and who could buy afford a house who already lives there. I think there is a, an interest in seeing how we could provide more home ownership opportunities of residents of these neighborhoods who are currently living there. And um, I think we should keep our eye on that. This, it, I think this isn't really the time to look at that process, that whole process and study it. And I know you won't have numbers off the top of your head anyway, but let's make sure that we think about doing that for the future. Um, but for now, I'm happy to move forward um, with this. So I will move the land sale at 3257 Logan Avenue North to Quaint Investment. Um, who can certainly explore some of our energy efficiency and net zero ideas as well as when you move forward too. Any questions on that motion or other comments? Seeing none then, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. And that motion carries. And that is our last uh, land sale of today. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to our discussion items. Uh, the first discussion item is our Minneapolis 4D Affordable Housing Incentive Program establishment. Uh, committee members and others might recall that we um, had a pilot program earlier and now we're um, going to be look at, looking at, um, oh, yes. Sorry, Mr. Chair. I, I understood from staff that there may be a time sensitivity to the discussion item number three um, with folks who were here to speak who need to leave. So I just wanted to make sure that we got that information to you as needed. I hadn't heard about that. Is there, um, should we be worried about this? We could have amended the agenda uh, potentially. Chair Gordon, members of the committee, I apologize. Uh, we have one of the members who, uh, or one of the folks that has been invited to speak uh, that has some time constraints. I didn't know how long the presentations were going to be, but we have Steve Horsfield here from uh, Simpson Housing and another guest, and we may have just have some time sensitivity, so I wanted to uh, alert folks to that. Time sensitivity meaning uh, you'd like to go right now? If that were possible, that would be terrific. Um, with all due respect to my colleagues and yeah, that's a, I haven't checked in with the rest of them, but um, why don't we do that then and accommodate them? Um, I believe the other discussion items. Uh, there's two. There's two more. I know that we have one committee member that may have to leave as well, but um, we will nevertheless proceed with this. Um, So we'll go ahead with the Hiawatha uh, encampment discussion. I just want to warn my committee members that this is a notorious item for the council to want to discuss and ask questions on for a long time. So as we're moving into this, let's just be sensitive now that we've bumped two other items to come later um, and taken our longest item, potentially my, my item I predicted would be longer um, before that. So let's try to be succinct and get the information that we need and take the time we need, but be sensitive to that. Okay, now we're moving on with um, the last item on the agenda, which is the tent encampment on Hiawatha Avenue. 
My apologies, uh, Chair Gordon and members of the committee, and, and I will make it right with my colleagues and see that uh, at a later date. Um, my name is Naria Rivera Vandermyde, and we will try to be as quick as possible as we move forward. Um, but you have asked us to get an update on where we are with the encampment, uh, and we have some guests with us that I know that um, council members uh, uh, would like to hear from as well. Uh, I'm going to kick it off quickly to uh, David Frank um, to talk a little bit about where we are with the actual uh, navigation site right now uh, and invite him to come up. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, David Frank from CPED, just very briefly, I uh, wanted to give you an update on what's happening now with the navigation center. We understand from the site that two of the buildings will be down by later today, later today and uh, the subject of much discussion with you, the choice of the structures we made later this week in consultation with the now hired architect, with Red Lake's contractor, as well as with our partners here within the city from the health department, and also from uh, our newly hired consultant who you'll hear about in a minute, as well as um, our hope for shelter operator um, and our county partners. So we are trying to bring a, uh, a wide net to this, but also keep moving as quickly as possible and we will make that choice later this week. So those are my quick updates. If you have any questions for me, I'm sitting over there. Mary is back. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to provide a quick update on where we are at the encampment right now. Uh, and we were uh, really happy to hear from folks on the ground uh, uh, from MUD and from Red Lake who are working to continuously update the census that we have provided that there is only one family left at the encampment. That does not mean that we are stopping to work from families. Uh, there was a question uh, posed uh, during the course of our conversations with policymakers about placement and I can share some numbers provided and from the county and David Hewitt is here with us should, should you have additional questions. And then a representative from Red Lake also sent me um, some uh, information about their work with Avivo. To date from the county, they have 15, they have placed 18 families into shelter, three families into supportive housing, 17 single adults into supportive housing, 15 housing referrals have either been canceled and we don't know quite yet uh, what the purpose, what the reason for that, if they left or couldn't be contacted or turned down. Um, housing that was offered and there are 60 open referrals to, ho to housing programs and so that is continuous work that moves forward. From Red Lake and their work with Avivo, we have heard uh, that they are working with 45 heads of household, uh, 16 individuals or heads of households on a short waiting list for the next available case manager. Um, the 45 that they are working with are all actively engaged and the 16 on the waiting list are checking in regularly. Three individuals have signed leases and moved into their apartments. Four approvals for housing with move-in dates are scheduled for November 1st. 21 applications have been submitted that we are waiting on approval or denial information. And of those 21 applications, seven of those folks, if approved, will be, able to, will be able to move into apartments between now and next Tuesday. So work on placement is happening rap rapidly. Uh, and one of the things that Aviva wanted to make sure in Red Lake is that even though perhaps we don't have actual families staying overnight at the encampment, it does not mean we're not working with families because it means that families are separated. There may be children who are in Little Earth or staying with friends or relatives elsewhere. And our goal is to make sure um, that we find some spots where families can be together. Uh, I'll also just say that we have been working, uh, and you may have seen recently, we are concerned about life safety issues, um, particularly thinking ahead to possible snow. MnDOT was out in community speaking to Red Lake and to MUD leadership and to camp leadership about um, placing some barriers uh, and some jersey barriers and some fencing by the guardrails, uh, particularly as we're anticipating in the future snow and having snow plow and making sure that is cleared. Um, that we wanted to make sure that safety was our first and foremost concern. Happy to say that everyone that we worked with from NA to the individual encampment residents to Red Lake, they, they all received that news favorably and helped move and transition those tents and those barriers were, uh, are being placed up today as a matter of fact. So that work has been really collaborative and moving forward. 
The other note that I'll say is there have been rumors about the current hygiene service area being closed down at the end of the month. If you recall, the current hygiene area is a place off across the street from Franklin. Mike Gozi is someone who put that up really quickly. It provides shelter, it provides um, shower services, and frankly, a centralized place by which um, the county and other outreach workers could provide uh, a safe space to get intake to do intake and do housing referrals and placement. And that we have committed to continuing on until the start of the navigation center. So that will remain open. We are gonna be working with them to help uh, work with our philanthropic community to see how we can help secure um, funding assistance for that, but they have agreed to maintain that open. It is to us essential that the hygiene service area remain open as that moves forward. Uh, the state and the county continue to help in their assistance and they could not be here with us today, but the state is doing everything they can to accelerate where needed any funding resources going through. They are working directly with uh, Red Lake and some of our outreach providers. And as uh, David mentioned and or, or shared with his update, and I know uh, that we've been doing with the county in terms of providing some additional assistance with outreach workers, which is another ask. We're trying right now to, to pair the current outreach efforts with some of the more um, community trusted folks so that we can get better outcomes as that moves forward. So I'll share that we've got two folks today that I know um, that folks are interested in speaking with. We have Margaret King, who we had mentioned we were successful. I can now um, really say it publicly. Uh, Poled Foundation has stepped up and um, approved funding for a project manager uh, so that we uh, are not singularly holding all of this together. We're I believe no one's happier than I am that that has come forward. Um, and Margaret King is with us. She uh, was previously in Seattle and has helped uh, uh, implement the navigation center there and also just enmeshed in this work, so knows a little bit about what the landscape is like. And then really happy to say that um, Steve Horsfield is here uh, as well and happy to address um, the council on what the Shelter Collaborative is planning on doing moving forward and their commitment to ensuring that what we're doing both at the encampment right now and as we think about designing a navigation center and really critically services that they really are uh, formed and informed and really led by community voice and community need. So I will step back uh, and um, which one would like to address council first? <laughs> Are you if you're ready, please. No, go, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, thank you very much. I'm Steve Horsfield, Executive Director with Simpson Housing Services, and I am here before you today on this very difficult and complex matter of the concentrated representation of the ongoing housing crisis um, in our community that we see at Franklin and Hiawatha. Um, and I am representing the collaborative of, of agencies that provide single adult shelter services in Hennepin County, which is Catholic Charities, Our Saviors Housing, Simpson Housing, St. Stephen's, St. Stephen's Human Services, and the Salvation Army. The, the directors of these organizations um, around shelter uh, meet regularly and um, have, we have, we have positioned ourselves in this discussion um, in a way such that we ideally we would like to be able to provide operational support um, with the voice of native leadership and of residents of the encampment um, to inform design for, for what services should look like. And and so I'm, I know that Margaret's going to speak and that's one of the things that she and I um, got into immediately was the idea of getting focus groups together to make sure that whatever it is that we um, that we offer at a, as a community um, at, at the Navigation Center is something that is going to be um, taken up by uh, by residents of the encampment and is a successful utilization of resources. Um, we are uh, scheduling a meeting with Margaret and one of the suggested uh, agenda items um, in a conversation with, um, with Council President Bender yesterday um, is this idea of what would we like to see the conditions under which um, uh, our shelter operation, our shelter operators would step up um, in that support role, um, and th those would be things like um, making sure that we've got authentic voice from the community, that uh, from the users, uh, as far as how that should be designed, um, as well as all the things around harm reduction. Um, we have a, we have a strong perspective, given that we are single adult shelter operators. We have a strong um, position that we would we would prefer that there not be minor children um, in a in a in an environment where we're also 
practicing harm reduction and doing work with, uh, with single adults. Um, we do want to see it be a service-rich environment, and we have lots of things to say about um, amenities in terms of um, showers and, and, and um, uh, bathroom facilities and those sorts of things to make sure that this is done in as dignified a way as possible. And so we are looking forward to have those conversations are happening very quickly, um, and uh, we're looking forward to getting to a point where, where we can find a way um, to define the roles um, for how we would be able to, to step up in a support manner um, around, around the operation of services at the Navigation Center. I think we have a question from Council Member Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually just wanted to thank you and the other four providers for stepping up. The five operators who serve single adults in the city I know have um, are doing a lot with not enough resources already, and there are waiting lists for the available beds that you have um, today. And I know that um, you know stepping up now and responding to this crisis response that the city is is taking is, is stretching the organizations even more thinly. And so I just want to express my deep appreciation for all that you do in the community already and for so many years. Two of the shelter operators operate in Ward 10 and they have my strong support and have been excellent partners in the community. Um, so it's really, really meaningful that you're willing to do this. I think I just want to be clear that um, I think it's been important to include these five operators in the design of the navigation center itself because some of these critical questions will there be, will there be children there it sounds like no there really can't be if we're talking about one of these five operators will it serve both men and women if so then likely there would be some site design considerations to to take into account so just having folks there at the table who are so experienced and providing emergency shelter for people i think is just a critical critical and just not you know it's not possible to do this uh, without you at the table and then I also did want to just um, underscore this request um, which is kind of the question what would it take to get one of the operators to be able to do this in terms of funding in terms of time in terms of staff capacity in terms of are there any sort of non-negotiable details that we should know before we purchase buildings or do anything else with the site that would be critical to being able to secure one of the five operators to be able to operate this site in addition to your normal day-to-day -day already very stretched thin work so thank you thank you so I have a question my understanding is that there are children at the encampment and has there been some decision made that the navigation center won't be able to serve children so so what I had stated was our preference um, as the collaborator of, pro of providers I, I think that ultimately your question would be answered when we sit down with um, the voice of the community native leadership and figure out what the what the navigation center service model is going to look like so there so that the, you, you you asked the question as though I'm making decisions about what how the how the navigation center is going to be operated well I don't, wasn't sure who made the decision but there, no there and, and there was no decision okay. I, I'm just to be clear um, we, we had a we, we have come forward with a strong preference um, that around child safety that we that we would prefer that that not be the case not to say that that's a that that is a, it's a it's our preference that, that is, is I'm stating today well and I know your your um, model is single adults Correct. and all everybody that you listed that's what they provide I believe maybe not exclusively but they're mostly single adult shelter providers yes we all uh, a number of us also do family yeah. services um, but yes in terms of shelter we are talking about single adult shelter operators and and I'm not saying I'm necessarily completely close to that but we would need an alternative for the children then and maybe another family navigation center or a location on the same site separated obviously um, I would make one safety is I would make one observation on that point and that was simply that um, Nuria that went listed uh, a great deal of activity that's taken place around housing placement um, since this uh, since the encampment began and there has been quite a bit of activity we um, uh, people serving people is a key partner in our community serving families they did have capacity at the beginning of this um, we set up a fast track we um, there was there was a fast track process that was yeah. set up and and a number of families have been successfully moved and that is continuing so I, it would be my hope that 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 they would have frankly better solutions for those those families with small children than the navigation center. and that would be a great alternative that would satisfy my concerns as well and I know of some several individual families that have gotten to the Drake for example so I know that that has been working uh, yep. but I'm I would be concerned if it was child protection stepping in or something else and somehow we ended up 
um, having families split up just so that the, the parents could get to some, I don't know. So it gets complicated. But I don't want to distract us too much, even though obviously that did raise some ire. So go ahead. Chair Gordon and members of the committee, I, I want to say that we share that thought as well. We do not want to see families separated in any shape or form. Uh, the county uh, has already stepped up a lot of efforts. As you mentioned, uh, there's availability at, and they've got vouchers for the Drake Hotel. We are focused our efforts right now on doing nothing more than between now and the time that the Navigation Center opens, is to make sure that families are taken care of first, followed by the elderly. These are concerns of ours, of our most vulnerable communities, that we really want to make sure that we um, endeavor to take care of and because of our commitment to try to move that forward we are hopeful that we won't by the time the navigation center uh, opens have families there and that's one of the reasons that while there are no and I want to say this because if we had children at the encampment staying overnight there are some mandated reporter requirements and we are trying not to go that route families that is why children are staying with neighbors or relatives or staying near the encampment but not staying at the encampment even though they may be there during the day but our goal is to try to keep families together and to make sure that there are other opportunities for them. Anything further for me? Ms. King? Welcome. Uh, hello, thank you. It's good to be here. Um, so I've been asked to just share a little bit about my background so you know a little more about uh, who I am. Um, I just moved here from Seattle. I have been living in Seattle for about 27 years. I grew up in Minneapolis, and I'm glad to be back here and excited about doing this work here. Um, I don't think I anticipated being in front of the in front of a city council as quickly as that has happened, um, but I am excited to be doing this work here, so thank you for having me. Um, in Seattle, my role was I worked as a director of a large multi-service agency for serving single adult homeless people experience homelessness uh, with a focus on people with, with uh, behavioral health and physical and mental health disabilities and chronic long, long, long periods of time on the street. Um, that agency was the largest provider of services of that nature in the Pacific Northwest region. We served about 10,000 different people over a year, um, operated 500 shelter beds and 1,200 permanent housing units, and served about 6,000 people in licensed behavioral health programs. So it was a very large, it had a very large footprint. Um, when the mayor of Seattle decided, uh, after visiting San Francisco in 2015, had, had already declared a state of emergency in Seattle on homelessness and went to San Francisco, and saw their navigation center, came back to Seattle and decided that the, he wanted that to happen in Seattle. And so our agency uh, ended up doing it, being the provider. So what it really essentially is, is a, um, a, a, a unique uh, design of shelter, both in its physical design and its service design, uh, um, that would be attractive for people experiencing homelessness who are living in encampments and who traditionally reject uh, existing kind of mainstream shelters. Um, and so what that means is that it's 24-7. Um, it's low barrier, so there's, there's few rules to access. It's, it's, uh, you kind of come as you are. You bring your uh, partners and you bring your all your belongings and you bring your animals and you just come and uh, so we were excited to do that because we've we've done that kind of shelter for a long time and we knew that people will accept shelter if it uh, doesn't require them to leave too much of their autonomy and uh, dignity at the door and so there's a subset of people that really need uh, this kind of shelter so I was really excited when um, I heard that Minneapolis wanted to do a navigation center. It's one piece of a larger homeless response system, and it does seem to, that model I described does seem to serve a particular subset of homeless folks uh, better than other models that we've all tried. Um, and I know that you all know that. Um, Seattle, um, I'm, I'm not, I'm, it seems like it's possible Minneapolis is going the way of the West Coast economically. It's a thriving economy here. Vacancy rates are really low. Um, two and a half percent is what I read the other day in Minneapolis. And that's what's happening on the West Coast. And so there's, as you know, there's just massive unsheltered homelessness happening all up and down the West Coast. 
And in Seattle, that is about 5,000 people living outside, um, another 5,000 people living in shelter and transitional housing. Um, the city of Seattle, is, as all cities uh, faced with this um, really vexing problem, are all are doing their best. You know, there's no. I was asked yesterday if there was a best practice that I was aware of for encampment response, and there. I said there wasn't. What I regret, I didn't really finish that thought, which is that um, I really believe that better is better. And if we can help people get into humane, safe environments, um, even if it's inconvenient for them or for us, it's the right thing to do. So I was just really glad to see Minneapolis was going to try to take this up. It's temporary. It's going to give us a chance to see uh, what works and what uh, doesn't. And um, so that is exciting to me. I will also say that I have been really impressed and heartened by the level of um, cross-jurisdictional collaboration happening in Minneapolis. I have not. That was not my experience in Seattle. Um, local governments work really hard in Seattle, um, but there wasn't a lot of collaboration of the nature I've seen here. And I've been really, uh, I think that's just a really important ingredient. And so um, thank you for that. Um, and I think maybe I'll just leave it at that. So I'm, hopefully I'll be useful to everybody here. So thanks for having me. Thank you. It's, um, it's great to have you here. Appreciate that. Uh, did you have a question, Councilman Bellison? Uh, first, I just wanted to thank uh, both you guys for uh, coming in and talking to the council. Um, you know, this is a unique issue that we're looking to, that we're looking to uh, be a major part of solving. Um, I did have one question for for both of you guys, uh, uh, but I imagine that the question will come out like answers will be different given your different perspectives. One is. Um, uh, from both the structural standpoint, but then also from a service standpoint, you know, this site is going to, um, uh, Red Lake Nation is looking to build affordable housing on this site um, in, uh, you know, with, yeah, in June. And so, uh, and so making sure that we are being a good partner with Red Lake Nation and figuring out how we utilize the space in the way that they're allowing us to, but then also respect their timeline and, and make sure that we can transition uh, this site off of their space um, uh, in, in a responsible way. Um, as far as feasibility goes, from any angle of this, uh, uh, you know, what is sort of your, your kind of expert opinion on what that will take and the feasibility of that? Um, uh, yeah, just wanted to throw that out there. On, man, on it being a temporary intervention? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, okay. yeah, like, uh, yeah, how temporary, you know, if, is, is it sort of too soon, is our timeline sort of too tight to both make it happen and transition out of it. Um. Right. Well, I, you know, hopefully Steve will respond too. I, I think that um, there's challenges certainly to doing anything on such a fast timeline. As I said, I really have been impressed with how much, um, uh, how much investment kind of with people's time across all these different uh, partners has been going on. So that really helps move things much more quickly. Um, you know, what I, what I have found over my years of doing this work is that, um, and especially I will say now that I'm living back in the Midwest and I'm trying to mentally prepare for winter, um, getting people indoors um, during the coldest hours, during the coldest months of the year is important. And, it, and, you know, all shelter does save lives. This kind of a shelter that's enhanced where there's lots of services saves lives and also gets people on a track of making the connections they need to make around their income and their stuff to get into the housing market. Um, it's not going to solve unsheltered homelessness by the spring, um, but it's going to teach us a lot, I think, and it's going to help us figure out how to build on that for our overall, for the cities, the Twin Cities overall unsheltered homelessness strategy. So I think it's a good investment. Yeah. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, uh, um, Commissioner Nelson. Um, the uh, honestly, the, the thing that is give, that gives me the most hope in regards to that particular question about getting ramped up quickly and and making good use of this time that we have from now till June with the site is everything that Nuria ran down with her opening remarks. Um, we we would approach. Obviously, based on what we hear from the native from the native community and from the residents of the encampment about what they would like to see in terms of a service model and how that should be all laid out. Um, that being said, we would we would walk into that looking at it with layers with the existing service responses that are already happening, 
it would not be operating in isolation which is how we do things anyway you know our shelter for example we have health care for the homeless on site we have you know we work together is how we do this so given that we've already got we've got increasing momentum around housing placement work that's happening I think that that is the most critical element then that we that we sort of put some infrastructure around this with market project management and with the input from the community and shelter operations to care for it to arrange for the fiscal space while all these housing placement activities are moving forward and these services are working together to make good use of this time councilmember Bender thank you mr. chair I think I know the answer but I'm wondering how we're doing on developing a budget for a service rich 24 7 operational shelter because one of the biggest barriers to having that in any of our existing sites is not desire but but funding chair Gordon council president Bender if the response that you were thinking you had is that we don't have one yet then that is correct but not because we haven't been working on it in fact the the meeting that is happening later this week with CPAD and Steve and Margaret and other folks to really think about it it will impact so budget is of course impacted by the type of structure by the type of services that are needed and making sure that we hear that from community and we think about what's feasible I've been told and I don't want to hold anybody to particular dates but we should have a budget within the next week or two and I'm more on the two side but we're hopeful that that will come forward and as soon as we have it we will forward that to you at the last council you created a working group and we have had our initial meeting and we actually had to that day that folks could come to we're hoping to have those every week this week may be interesting because I think what would be better is if we had the information from Friday's meeting but we're gonna start to schedule those periodically so that we can update everyone as we go because we know this is a fast-moving project and we want to make sure everyone has enough information so we're hoping to have budget to you soon and know that in part it's because we want to have the best possible budget knowing what services and what structure and what is intended to go into the space thank you mr. chair and and the intention right now is to rely on philanthropic funding for the operation costs is that right Chair Gordon, Council President Bender, I think right now we're trying to match funding. What we've heard from the county in terms of services is that they have a variety of funding streams and they haven't yet heard of one that they cannot match or divert to and where the gap is and that's where we would like to tap into our philanthropic partners. We've had a lot of conversations and we're ready, we're getting ready for an ask. For example, we know that we want some additional outreach uh, navigation outreach folks and community that are trusted that can get people to better placement outcomes that is a new model it is not that we don't have outreach out there but it is usually offered by known organizations or by the county or by um, some of the partners we want to make sure it comes from community because we believe the outcomes will be different so we have a budget request for that we want to continue to service the hygiene service area we have a budget request for that um, but there are a variety of other things as we think about what once the design is set what the new navigation center will need then we will go match those against what streams are available either from state or from uh, the county and to that gap we will then look to our um, partners to see how they can assist okay thank you mr. that's my last question I think um, just given so if, given the numbers that you went through quickly at the beginning um, in the success of placing folks into either shelter or housing it still seems like the number of folks at the encampment hasn't been diminishing because new people are coming and so um, I'm just wondering how we're designing the size of the navigation center and just given that the decisions about structure will be made in the next few days and then the details about operating budget and operational like an ideal budget and actual operating dollars available won't be ready for a week or two after that so how are we balancing planning for a structure without those kind of critical elements yet in place 
Chair Gordon, Council President Bender, although there there is uh, truth to the fact that as people are placed and new people are coming in, the relative numbers at the encampment has actually remained pretty stable lately. Uh, and so, and by lately, I mean the past few weeks since the red light census. We have, I, I know that there are folks that see uh, tents out at the Hiawatha encampment. Not all of those are occupied. Some of those are now being used for storage. So we're working on taking some of those down and creating space as well. Um, so we are uh, engaging, and it is one of the reasons it's critical to engage the people on the ground. Uh, so Red Lake and MUD will be part of these discussions about design. They have been on the ground every single day and know what that flow of folks are. And so I think that our numbers of about 150 and 100 uh, to 200 have been pretty uh, steady. We know that there are some people who will choose not to be at the encampment. We also know that as we continue to place families that that will also reduce uh, numbers as well so we're feeling fairly confident that we have enough uh, information to move forward with a design the other uh, thing I will say uh, and I know that I spoke to uh, mud prior to coming here is that a lot of this will depend on our help with our mud leadership and our NA uh, folks on the ground and Red Lake as well. There is a community meeting uh, really intended, uh, facilitated and intended to be for Native American community uh, next week, where part of these discussions about what do we do at this encampment, how do we provide for safety, how do we make sure that the folks that are in this census are getting ready and transitioned and pathwayed into the navigation center, and then how do we continue to close the footprint as we have opportunities are all discussions that they will be having as well because we depend on their assistance as we move forward. Well, thank you very much. I'll also note that we've been joined by Councilmember Ponsano and Councilmember Cano. Thanks for being here. Um, do you think that suffices for your report for today? Uh, Chair Gordon, the only thing I'd add to that is that I just want to make sure to highlight, and I, I realize that as we're talking about this encampment, I want to say out loud again that we are not just focused on this encampment, that obviously this is highlighted longer term issues. Uh, I wanted to note what my colleague at State, Kathy Tenbrook, has said. Uh, she's facilitating an unsheltered homelessness design team of outreach workers, housing and service providers, people experiencing homelessness, uh, city, county, state department, agency staff, philanthropy, and so forth to develop uh, recommendations on a regional approach. So hopefully by um, early next year that will be coming forward uh, and include uh, city involvement as well. To, so I say that only to say that we have not lost sight that this encampment is but one issue, that the issue of the unsheltered homelessness population persists throughout our city, uh, and that some of the, the learnings that we have from this encampment we're hoping to uh, be able to bring forward in different ways and perhaps approach uh, how we respond to homelessness in different ways in the future. So I, don't, I didn't want to forget that, um, or leave the impression that we are not thinking about longer term solutions as well. But with that, happy to stand for questions and order some apology cupcakes for CPEN. <laughs> um, I appreciate that. I also will note that um, originally when you came and presented some ideas um, a few weeks ago, uh, one was a navigation center and the other was for a culturally um, informed transitional housing project and we asked you to come back on this date and report in on that. Uh, culturally informed transitional mm -hmm. housing project, I I'm going to take that la those last comments you mm -hmm. made. Was your up dating us, saying we haven't forgotten, mm -hmm. we're still interested, but we haven't necessarily gotten to anything specific. Um, we're actually hoping that the state and other partners are going to help us do that. I do know that there are some new housing opportunities that are culturally informed opening in the area too, and I think that's going to help address some of those needs. But we'll, we can pick up on these discussions at future meetings and future opportunities. because. I still think we can try to efficiently complete the work of our committee. I don't see any other questions, and I think um, people can feel free to reach out to staff along the way and also um, work group members. And I understand that Councilmember Fletcher is on the work group, Councilmember Ellison, um, so, and Kano, so, and Morsami. So, council members or at least committee members feel like we can connect and reach in that way and get more details and I know that some of you have been reaching out to us to make sure we were briefed and brought up to speed and I appreciate that. So on that note then I'll move to receive and file this report. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. 
That motion carries. And now let's get a, a brief 4D presentation. Um, and I know that we um, we had a study of our first 4D pilot program, and um, we asked you to come back with recommendations, and now we're going to get to hear about them. Welcome, Mr. Porter Nelson. Thank you, and good afternoon, Chair Gordon and members of the committee. My name is Dean Porter Nelson, and I'm a Housing Stability Specialist on CPES Residential Finance Team. And I'm here today to present a proposal from city staff to establish the Minneapolis 4D Affordable Housing Incentive Program. So the term 4D refers to the 4D property tax classification in the state of Minnesota, and that offers a lower tax rate and is reserved for properties with rent and income restrictions. And the Minneapolis 4D incentive program is an innovative housing strategy that offers owners of naturally occurring affordable housing or NOAA housing with an opportunity to qualify for the 4D tax classi classification. And um, as you, you mentioned, Chair Gordon, the city's 4D pilot program, um, which was offered this spring, did generate substantial interest from rental property owners. And so as such, the city staff um, are recommending that the city council build on the success of the pilot by establishing this new Minneapolis 4D affordable housing incentive program. Participants in the 4D pilot were asked to make a 10-year commitment to keep at least 20% of the apartments in their buildings affordable to and occupied by households that are making 60% of area median income or less. And participants are eligible for a 40% tax rate reduction on designated affordable units. And then they also have access to a dedicated pool of program funds within the city's green business cost share program. Qualification for 4D tax status requires that participants submit annual application paperwork to Minnesota Housing, and the standard application deadline is March 31st. And I'll, I'll note that although that deadline had already passed by April 27th of this year, which is when the city authorized the 4D pilot, city, the city was able to work closely with Minnesota Housing to enroll a, a limited number of participants during what ended up being a very short six-day application window. So staff have previously submitted a report to the council um, about outcomes of the pilot program, but we didn't get a chance to discuss that, so I wanted to briefly touch on some of the highlights of that report now. So there were a total of 22 applications for 463 units for the pilot program, and ultimately we were able to accept 10 applications from eight different property owners and across eight, eight different city council wards preserving the affordability of 207 housing units in Minneapolis with minimal budget expenditures and limited tax base impacts. The city paid just $1,680 in application fees to Minnesota Housing and spent $500 on affordability declarations that were recorded with Hennepin County. And in addition to that, the city dedicated $50,000 in green business cost share funds to 40 participants. The city assessor's office has also estimated that there will be a total tax base impact of about $124,000 for the 2019 calendar year. The pilot program I also want to highlight was very successful in encouraging property owners to consider energy efficiency improvements to their buildings. Staff from the city and from the Center for Energy and Environment encouraged all program participants to do an energy assessment on their properties. And so far, five out of eight participants in the pilot have either already done that assessment or have expressed interest in the assessment and the funding from the city. And so um, based on that, we do anticipate that we'll be spending 100% of the dedicated energy efficiency funds, and that's gonna result in improved housing quali quality and lower utility bills. And I also want to note that based on feedback from rental property owners that participated in the pilot, the program was attractive to them in part because it offered uh, what we refer to as an administrative light touch. And by that we mean um, there was not uh, an unnecessary amount of paperwork that was required for the program. Participants were required to submit a rent roll 
a two-page application to Minnesota Housing, and then they needed to sign a participation agreement and affordability declaration that was drafted by the city attorney's office. And on an annual basis, participants will also need to report rent and income data to the city, and then they will also need to submit reapplication paperwork to Minnesota Housing on an annual basis. This, what we, what we see is that this streamlined application process and compliance process will ensure that the city can achieve the program's stated goals and report on outcomes annually, but it won't require an unreasonable amount of paperwork from the property owners. So based on the success of the pilot in preserving affordable housing and encouraging energy efficiency improvements, we do recommend establishing the affordable housing incentive program. And I attached the program guide as um, an attachment to this request for com committee action. And I want to go over some new program elements that do distinguish this program from the pilot we offered in the spring. This slide highlights some of those program elements and the remaining program criteria are identical to the pilot program. So first, rental property owners that participate in this new program will receive a small grant of $100 per housing unit, which will be capped at $1,000 per property, and that's in recognition of the limited but notable administrative burden that's associated with participation in the program. In addition, um, we're happy to, to report that participants will receive priority for the city's solar energy incentives. And um, just a little bit about those incentives is that when you pair the city's incentives with state incentives, um, a certain solar energy investments could actually generate enough energy um, that would help them pay for themselves in around six years. Um, and so that creates a lot of opportunities for property owners to make those investments, creates a strong incentive for them to do that, and that really does help to pair affordable housing with sustainability and make the, the existing NOAA housing we have in the city a lot greener. And uh, I also wanna highlight some new eligibility guidelines um, that staff are recommending. So first, buildings or tax parcels with as few as two units would now be eligible. And the city would have the right to deny any application um, if there is a concern about housing quality due to outstanding issues with regulatory services. Finally, participants in the program, um, based on the staff recommendation, would now agree to limit rent increases on existing tenants um, to 6% or less annually. Um, and that would help to ensure housing stability for those existing tenants. Staff are proposing that we open an annual application period for this program, and um, for the first year that would uh, happen in late November, or early December, and the city's application would be due sometime in February, giving us time to submit paperwork to the state by the March 31st deadline in 2019. We did accept public comments on the program, and staff has shared all of those comments with this committee. A few details about the anticipated costs of the program and some anticipated impacts of the program. So the proposed affordable housing incentive program provides the city with an opportunity to preserve affordability of a high number of housing units. And I'll note that the cost of this program is much lower than other city housing programs. The mayor's budget does include $250,000 for this program. And I would also note that if 1,500 units participate in the first year, that this would impact the city's tax base by just 0.2%, so a small impact. And I also want to let you know that I've received about 40 phone calls or emails from property managers or owners who are very interested in this program. And uh, so that's uh, very encouraging. And based on this high level of interest, prior to even establishing the program and based on um, some planned marketing efforts that we have, we expect that we can enroll somewhere between 700 and 1500 housing units um, in 2019 that those units would achieve 4D status. So uh, preserving the affordability of that many homes, many of which, which would also benefit from the energy efficiency incentives and uh, renewable energy incentives for solar, that would really help quite a bit to address the ongoing affordable housing crisis in Minneapolis and could have a positive long-term impact on the lives of Minneapolis residents. So thank you for listening to this presentation. I enjoyed having the opportunity to share all the details about the pilot as well as some of the updates to the program. And if you have any questions, any questions from the, the committee, um, I would, would like to hear those now. 
Well, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate the report and your patience. I think we might have some questions or discussion. Of course. Member Goodman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Dean, I'm just, just thrilled with your work. I had the good fortune, and I would urge others to have Dean present NOAA strategies at my Lunch with Lisa meeting last month. It was the highest attended Lunch with Lisa meeting in the past numbers of years. And we pitched it as, what can you do to help solve the affordable housing crisis? Um, meaning, could you buy a property that's 4D, that would receive 4D and become a property owner? And so one of the things I think that's really great about this recommendation is it goes from two units and up. If we really want the general public to kind of become little landlords, even in their own homes, you know, so their house and two others, for example, um, people are showing up to pay attention to whether or not this is something they could do to help solve the problem. So I really love the flexibility to go down to two units. Um, I think your presentation of the entire thing is really great. Your work is amazing. I'll lastly say that I really appreciate your approach to the energy efficiency uh, guidelines. I think it's really important from the folks that I've talked to that are in the program that they see this as an incentive. Oh, I get an energy review, not audit, <laughs> And then I can qualify for solar or I can qualify for energy efficiency upgrades is a different way of saying it than you're required to do an energy audit. I think the light touch at first so folks sign up is really important. This really needs to be seen as something that we're asking to partner with property owners on, not regulate the heck out of them. We would have no ability to conduct 700 to 1500 energy audits in one year anyway. So we might as well encourage people to do it, offer them an incentive, see how many we can grab that way, and as the program progresses over time, see who else we can capture at the end. So I very much appreciate the approach. I am um, happy to see this moving forward, and I thank you for your work. Thank you. Councilmember Schrager. I, I just want to echo Councilmember Goodman's uh, comments. I, I would differ a little bit on the energy efficiency. I think it's important while we have landlords at the table to be talking about it. I think the approach right now, um, as Councilmember Goodman talked about, of making sure it's an incentive makes sense right now. Uh, but as this um, program grows to see, to reevaluate that, to see is there more that we could be asking as it grows in popularity, if you know, energy efficiency is another way that we can add um, and maybe limit who's who the best candidate is. I was also happy to see uh, the kind of the looking at tier three and some of the pilot. I saw some folks got um, were able to get in 40 that have tier three buildings in some areas and are tier one. And that's they did get it for the tier one, but not for the tier three. But um, I would I like that we'd be a little bit more picky. Um, and then something um, else I just see 4D as becoming kind of a critical foundation for where this city is going um, in our approach to housing. It's, it's something that we're building on, especially, you know, we're looking at um, an ordinance for advance notice, and this is one of the requirements or, that we, we look to. So I, I just want to echo the thanks for the work. I guess I had one question. I also did want to make one comment. I enjoyed reading the comments that we got and the feedback that were provided. I noted one person said, why don't you, uh, and I think it's a landlord, said it should the uh, increase should be held down to 3%, not 6% that's allowed. I noticed we kept the recommendation at 6. Um, we also, the guidelines say that the um, free energy efficiency and healthy homes assessments will only be available to those units that are those um, participants that have five more units. Um, I'm wondering was why that's in there, why it wouldn't be available to somebody with a duplex or triplex, and is that something that the utilities or the SIP program or some program we're matching it with dictated? Um, so, so thank you, Chair Gordon and members of the committee for those comments and, and the question, Chair Gordon. So I actually um, can speak to the two to four units and the energy efficiency assessments. And I, um, so I think that the initial um, information that went out for public comment, we had noted that the assessments were available to buildings five units and above, and that was the understanding of staff at the time. Um, however, um, had the opportunity a little bit later on, just about a week ago, to talk with some members of center, some staff members at Center for Energy and Environment, and actually learned that the Home Energy Squad program that they offer provides energy assessments for buildings between two and four units. Um, so that's 
Um, actually, I, I did update um, the latest version of the criteria. I believe it does say that we are now able to offer the energy assessments for um, those properties through the Home Energy Squad. So it's just a different program that offers the energy assessments, but um, we are able to offer some kind of assessment at either free or low cost to any um, you know entity that would participate in this program. Well, that's great news. Yeah. I, I think I may have a slightly updated, outdated, I guess, not updated set of guidelines, but um, the, our understanding then is that will be in the guidelines that go out there that, that's available that's correct. to all units. Excellent. Seeing no other, oh, Council Member Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just quickly, I um, want to make a couple comments. Uh, one is that this is a game changer for boards like mine where 80% of people are renters and are we're rapidly losing you know, the, these kinds of affordable units. So I think it's really, really exciting. I'm also very excited about the expansion of the program and the um, reduction down to two units. Again, that's where we see a lot of the most affordable units in the community. I did ask the assessor's office to try to coordinate with this program because as buildings are sold in my ward and across the city, we're using those values to assess the property tax bills for adjacent properties that may be um, much more affordable than the new buildings and so that's like a standard practice across the state but the very least we could do I think is communicate to those property owners that are seeing significant tax increases because of that methodology that we have this program and we hope that they'll participate so I'll follow up with the assessor's office to make sure that that is happening um, I also wanted to just comment that I'm interested to track how we're defining affordability over time and how much we think we can get out of this program back just in terms of the rent increases and also the length of time. Um, so I you know, just kind of look to staff to just be doing that evaluation. And then I'm also really excited about potentially taking what we're learning from this program and starting to create a new um, group of pres what are basically preservation buyers potentially in our city. And I think we have this funding for NOAA preservation that's been difficult to get out the door because of all of the challenges that we have in competing in the open market for sales of buildings in this super hot market. Um, but I know that we have you know thousands and thousands of these very small property owners across the city that be own between one and four units. And if we could find a way as a city to help them expand their portfolio, you know, likely I think a lot of them are local owners who live you know, in the community, maybe they own a duplex and they rent out one unit. So I think there's an exciting opportunity to build on this program and learn from it and potentially expand it into a broader preservation strategy that's about how do we create entrepreneurship opportunities for local property owners, but also expand our preservation buyer um, portfolio for these very small buildings that the bigger nonprofits really aren't able to capture. So thank you for the amazing work. Thank you very much. I don't see any other, any other comments or questions. Um, so then I'm just going to go ahead and move uh, approval of this item, and that includes the resolution uh, delegating the authority to make and execute our 4D affordable housing incentive program and adopting the form documents and also authorizing it um, to proceed. I guess there's two actions there you can see on the agenda. Any discussion on that motion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. That motion carries. And now we'll move on to our last item. Um, should have been our second to last, sorry about <laughs> that. The uh, 2018 Affordable Housing Trust Fund. This is a report in response to some staff directions um, that um, this committee made some time ago. Welcome. Yes, good afternoon, Chair Gordon and members of the committee. I'm Angie Skeldum. I'm the manager of residential finance and the CPED housing team. Back in May, Councilmember Reich and this committee uh, directed staff to evaluate funding gap needs, leverage opportunities, and timing considerations for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and report back with recommendations on funding limits. I am here today with a receive and file report on that direction. The recommendations before you today do not require a vote at this time. These program rules are implemented through the trust fund RFP document, which staff brings to this committee and council in April or May of every year. So that's where uh, any changes would be formally incorporated in the future. Uh, that said, I thought it would be helpful to start with a little refresher for the committee on what the current program rules are in this regard. 
Overall, there is a $25,000 per unit maximum award. This lament has not changed since it was instituted, which we believe was in about 2011. Since 2016, we have also had a special program within the trust fund called the Family Housing Initiative that allows up to $50,000 per unit for three bedroom units that serve households at or below 30% of the area median income who are also homeless or at risk of homelessness. This special limit is to incent production of these important units and also to recognize the impact that 30% units have on a project's pro forma. In addition, last year the council created a contingency pool that allows for an up to additional $15,000 per unit to close final gaps and get projects to financial closing. This has been a highly successful approach and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it in a few minutes. So per the staff direction, we analyzed a myriad of different factors in considering recommendations for you today for the 2019 award limits, including construction cost trends, timing considerations, constraints from other funding sources, city housing policy goals, and others. And our recommendations and rationale are as follows. Uh, first, we recommend that the general award limit be increased from $25,000 to $30,000 per unit. Second, we recommend that a new award limit of $40,000 per unit for two bedroom units at 30% AMI be added. Third, we recommend maintaining the existing $50,000 per unit limit for three bedroom units at 30% of AMI. Fourth, we recommend that you continue to set aside funds for a contingency pool. And fifth, we recommend that there be some modifications to the eligibility for pipeline awards. Currently, only projects that have previously applied to the trust fund but were not awarded are eligible. Staff proposes a change to allow any projects that meet trust fund requirements to apply on a pipeline basis, provided that they can close within six months and subject to availability of funds. Here's the rationale for these recommendations. First and foremost, it's important to maintain a per unit limit. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund is a gap source, not a primary funding source. These resources leverage other sources like tax credit investments, federal home loan bank, state bonding money, and any of the up to dozen other sources that can be involved in these projects. It's important to maintain this limit in order to maximize our ability to leverage those other funds. Second, according to data from Minnesota Housing, the average total development cost per unit has increased 20% since 2005. Moving from a base award of $25,000 a unit to $30,000 a unit is a matching 20% increase and would allow us to catch up with inflation and volatility in labor and construction costs. Third, in order to meet the city's housing policy and comprehensive plan goals of building both more large family units and providing more units at 30% of the area median income, we recommend the new tiers of higher subsidy for two bedroom units at 30% AMI and the maintenance of the even higher subsidy for three bedroom units at 30% of AMI. These higher subsidies offer our offerings would signal to the development community the importance and the value that the city places on these units and in sense their, their development. It is important to note, however, that this additional subsidy we propose in no way fully covers the gap that is created by the reduction of rents to a 30% level. We still see the higher proposed award levels as an acknowledgement of the developer's partnership in helping the city achieve our goals. Um, but I wanna note that production of units at 30% of AMI is still highly constrained by the availability of 9% tax credits, the state of Minnesota's housing infrastructure bonds, and project-based vouchers. And I wanna di digress on this issue for just a moment to walk you through a case study because there's a lot of conversation about providing affordability at 30% of AMI. And I just wanna show you um, kind of uh, how that plays out in a typical project. So uh, we invented a uh, hypothetical project that's 66 units with the following uh, alignment of units. 35 units at one bedroom, 18 units at two bedrooms, and 13 units at three bedrooms. In our project, um, of course, it's difficult to say, you know, every project varies. Uh, all the different variables um, are different from deal to deal. But in this deal, um, we built a project that actually works at cash flows if all of these units were at 60% of AMI. Just to show you what changing the AMI levels does to the uh, feasibility for these projects, if you reduced all of those units um, from 60% down to 50% of AMI, you'd create a $3 million gap in your project. 
if you wanted to go down to 30% of AMI just on the one bedroom units and leave everything else at 50% of AMI, you'd create a $6.4 million gap in your project. If you wanted to extend that 30% of uh, affordability to two and three bedroom larger units, um, the problem only grows from there. So I just thought it was important to uh, highlight that for the committee, um, what, what the impact of 30% uh, units does on a, on a typical project's pro forma. Getting back to the rationale for our other recommendations, uh, I wanted to talk just a minute about the contingency pool. Um, it's been in place for a year now and is and it's proving to be a very effective strategy for helping us get money out the door more quickly in support of producing more units more quickly. Contingency awards to four projects with an expected fifth in the works is allowing us to close on 268 affordable housing units that otherwise would still be stuck in the development pipeline. Program rules allow for additional awards between five and $15,000 per unit, and our average award is right around $9,000 per unit. It's a little bit more for projects that serve deeper affordability, a little bit less for projects that have uh, higher affordability levels. The flexibility that this resource affords staff is critical in getting projects out of the pipeline and uh, also very helpful um, in allowing staff to negotiate for additional project features that advance city goals like deeper affordability or more large bedroom units. Uh, and finally, the last recommendation around pipeline flexibility um, is the recommendation to modify the pipeline. We think that this is important uh, to allow the city to support smaller infield mixed income projects that may be largely privately financed in order to incent those projects to include a portion of their units as affordable. So currently, the once a year affordable housing trust fund pipeline process doesn't really align with the faster project timelines of these kinds of projects. And so um, we think that it's important to make this change so that we have the ability to support those kinds of deals. Again, noting that pipeline funding is subject uh, to the availability of funds overall. So I think I'll pause there and see if anybody has any questions about the award limit report and recommendations. Excellent, I'll keep going. Uh, the second uh, uh, staff direction that came last May was to report on the impact of trust fund policies and procedures on projects proposed for areas of the city where more than 50% of the population is racially diverse and to make recommendations to alleviate any negative impacts on projects in this area. Again, this is a receive and file uh, report. Any changes would be implemented through next year's tax, uh, trust fund RFP. And again, as a refresher, I will remind the committee that this year the City Council implemented changes to the economic integration scoring criteria in our 2018 RFP. The scoring system adopted by Council is reflected on this slide before you. And the differentiation of concentrated and non-concentrated areas was originally adopted by Council to encourage income integration and support locational choice. Per the staff direction, we have analyzed the results of trust fund policies to date on the distribution of funded projects in the city and the following map shows the results of that analysis. <clears throat> As you can see, projects have been funded both inside and outside of concentrated areas. Of the 136 projects seen here, 80 are located inside concentrated areas and 56 are outside. To the specific question of the staff direction, this map shows that the current policies are not resulting in negative impacts for projects located inside of concentrated areas. That said, the new comp plan and the anti-displacement policy network goals are reframing our language around affordable housing locations to recognize the assets, value, and cultural wealth in every part of the city. And the following staff recommendations are aligned with those goals. First, staff recommends continuation of the scoring system that was adopted by council in 2018. This scoring reduced the number of overall points available under the economic integration heading and reduced the overall point differential between concentrated and non-concentrated areas. When we took a look at the results of this change in this, uh, this year's current funding round, which we'll be bringing to committee uh, in the next cycle, um, it suggests to us that this change was effective in continuing to incent affordable housing in all areas of the city. Uh, furthermore, as scoring is only one component of trust fund selections, we recommend expressly stating in the RFP that geographic distribution is a significant factor considered in project selections. Secondly, the maximum limit to establish eligibility for the trust fund has historically been 50% of AMI rents. 
However, two years ago, the council approved a change that allowed projects that are located in concentrated areas to go up to 60% rents in order to encourage income integration and spur market rate development in those areas. At this time, staff is recommending eliminating that provision and returning to a uniform 50% rent limit for all areas of the city. We believe that this will help to um, prevent displacement and importantly, to create new housing opportunities that are more affordable to current residents in areas where incomes may be lower. I will note that other city resources will still be available to support the affordability at 30% of AMI, including tax credits and TIF. So I'll pause here to see if there's any questions about the racially diverse areas report and recommendation. Yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was wondering if the staff could please explain the bullet point number one, because um, just initially just reading the first portion of it, it would seem that it's in conflict with the second portion of it, but I might not be understanding quite what that second portion means, explicitly adding geographic distribution as a selection consideration. So if you could just unpack that bullet point for me one more time. Uh, sure, so uh, Chair Gordon, Council Member Cano, um, we are recommending to keep the scoring within the scoring section of the criteria the same. Uh, however, because scoring is not the only thing that we take into consideration, there's language elsewhere in the RFP document that says scoring is one thing, but project readiness is also another thing, and feasibility is another thing, and uh, you know, there's a list of other things. And what we want to do is just in that list add geographic distribution as being a selection factor as well. So that just means that we can um, use um, discretion to support projects that may be located in a variety of areas of the city um, outside of just the standard scoring, which is a practice that we do anyway. Okay, I have further questions on that, but I'm not gonna do that here now. Thank you. Happy to follow up with you later. So that concludes the RCA receive and file items. I'm now going to shift gears for a minute to follow up on some questions that were raised by uh, Council Member Bender at the CPED budget hearing related to the trust fund. And then I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues, Mark Ruff and Sasha Bergman to follow up on some questions that Council Member Schrader raised at that same meeting. So related to the uh, questions of the trust fund budget and spend down, I can offer uh, the following. As of today, there is approximately $9.2 million in the trust fund that is not committed to a specific project, not including a small uh, set aside of uh, contingency pool funds that remain. At the very next meeting of this committee, we will be bringing forward recommendation that commits all of this money. Funds that have been allocated in previous budget years to the trust fund are also 100% committed to projects. We do not let these projects linger in the pipeline indefinitely. All awards come with timely completion rules. Trust fund awards are reserved for 15 months from the point of council uh, approval. The developer must submit monthly progress reports, uh, letting us know how they're doing, moving towards closing. At the end of those 15 months, if they're not ready to close, and if the project, the, or excuse me, the developer can demonstrate that at least one third of their funds are in hand, and if they can provide evidence that the balance is likely to be raised, and they can provide evidence that the closing will occur within the next 12 months, staff has the ability to administer, uh, administratively extend that deadline for an additional 12 months. Projects that are unable to meet these timelines do have their awards rescinded so that those funds are available to be expended on projects that are more ready to go. As you'll be hearing again at the next meeting, the trust fund in this round received a record 16 applications for funds from uh, developers who had site control, and um, they requested a record $23 million in requests. Uh, secondly, I would point out that staff is making tremendous progress in clearing out our pipeline of projects um, that have been stuck. This table shows you the uh, projects that have trust fund funding that have closed so far in 2018. You can note that this includes over $10 million in trust fund support. You can roughly equate these closings to spending of dollars. Financial closing means that these funds are encumbered in the city's accounting system, legally committed to the project, and the spending process or draws can start at this point. 
Some projects draw all of their funds at closing, while others draw in chunks over the construction period, which, depending on the project, is typically six to 18 months. Looking ahead, uh, in 2019, we currently anticipate um, working on closing a number of projects that include uh, over $20 million in additional closings in 2019. As, sure. Well, you, busily counting the number in our ward and comparing it. Okay. Uh, you'll be hearing more, more about some of these projects in the coming committee meeting. I think that's good. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Goodman, are you comfortable with me moving forward? Okay. Okay. Yes, go ahead. It, when you go back to that chart, the 2019 projects that are listed as projected, are those some of the applications for the trust fund? I, I'm confused. You said there are 16 applications. Are these... Some of them are these, yes, and, and some of them are projects that have previously been awarded. So these are all projects that we anticipate um, may be in a position to close in 2019 if they are funded or are already funded. Okay, let's pick one. Northside Art Space Lofts. Never even heard of it before. How is it possibly going to close in 2019? Uh, council member, uh, uh, Chair Gordon, Council Member Goodman, um, you'll be hearing more about it at the upcoming session where we look at this year's trust fund awards. And this is a project that previously received an award of trust funds uh, two cycles ago. Uh, the awards were rescinded, but they've been working on the project, uh, and they're very easy. close to being ready to go. So they yes. had to turn money back, and now right. they're having to come back through again. Right. So they actually were allocated in a different right. year. Right. I, I'm trying to determine if the $20 million is all we have in requests, or there's more than this. Councilmember Goodman, this chart has nothing to do with the requests. This chart is just the projects that we anticipate, uh, if the stars align uh, correctly, we'll be able to potentially work towards closing in 2019. Okay. They're part of our existing pipeline of projects. So not, don't extrapolate from this Correct. how much money we might need to fund everything in the trust fund in one year going forward. Correct. Got it. Okay. Sorry for creating confusion around that. All right, this is my last slide. As it pertains to the 2019 budget, uh, just to let you know, this is a general timeline of how it would go. Starting in January 1, the budget would become available and eligible pipeline requests could be considered at this point going forward. In April or May, the Council will approve the 2019 RFP. In July, RFP applications will be due, and in October, awards will be made. A fully funded project could close, say, approximately within eight weeks of award approval, uh, stay, stay starting in January 2020. So again, per the timely completion rules, a project that is funded and is, uh, is awarded in October of 2019 would be required to close no later than January of 2021 by the 15-month rule or at the very latest January 2022 by uh, the 12-month extension to the full 27-month maximum. It's important to point out that these October awards are critical to leveraging additional sources necessary to complete projects. Increasingly, other funders hesitate to commit to projects the city hasn't already awarded. To put a finer point on this issue, for the group of projects that completed construction in 2017, $17 of other public and private money was leveraged for every dollar of city subsidy. So I hope this helps understand a little bit more about what the process and the timelines are associated with both commitments of funds and expenditures of funds. And to sum it up, I would simply state that if the goal is to produce significantly more affordable housing units, significantly more budget authority will be necessary to stimulate that construction. As we've discussed, there is significantly more demand for these resources than we currently have supply. There's less than 1% vacancy rate in affordable housing, and there's a severe shortage of resources throughout the entire system. But 2018 and 2018 and 2019 demonstrate how it's possible for us to do more, and these years represent a significant increase in both expenditures and productions from years past. With that, I'm going to take any questions uh, in addition on this topic, or um, I can hold those and turn it over to Mark and Sasha. 
I don't see any questions necessarily, but I do want to note that in terms of those first couple of recommendations having to do with the future requests for proposals, mm -hmm. I think if council members, if committee members have concerns or issues with those, um, that's something to think about, and I think we'd like to find out about them. Essentially what we're saying is we're going to keep giving some points for projects located in concentrated areas, just like we did this year, five points, um, but all the projects have to be uh, at 50% of area median income. There won't be any more awards for at 60. Um, I think those are some of the bigger differences for people to think about, um, uh, at least in my mind. And also, if you have concerns about increasing the amount of the awards, I know that that was, uh, there was some, we felt some pressure that we weren't giving enough per unit in terms of that, and I think it was your staff direction expressly focused on that. So I want to make sure you're aware of that and you think about that. And potentially before those next, um, the next RFP is approved, there's an opportunity to get a briefing from staff about it and see how it all fits into the package. And could you just remind us again when we'll be looking at that request for proposals? Uh, typically in April or May. April or May. All right. Thank you. And now um, uh, Council Member Reich may have a question or comment. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And, uh, your, your comments sort of prompted that there, there is future steps. Uh, however, as we advance towards those steps, I think this presentation was a very concise way to pivot around the issues. I think they're well drafted, and the fact that there was analysis and rationale that was concisely uh, packed in with the recommendations, I think will be very useful for us moving forward, and I commend the work to get us to that point. It was quite an excellently organized presentation. Thank you so much for your clarity. Uh, let's see if Mr. Ruff can uh, match that. <laughs> Welcome. Mr. Chair, I'm Mark Ruff, the city's chief financial officer. Mr. Chair, you know me too well. Um, I cannot follow with that level of both interest and uh, content. Uh, We're going to talk about money and specifically a response to a staff direction on um, how do we come up with funding for long-term affordable housing. And I think the staff direction was to say at least two options of city-only controlled money and that, that materially could increase, and I'm using the word material and not necessarily in the staff direction, but I understand that we're not just talking about a few hundred thousand dollars a year, but something materially that would improve funding for affordable housing on an ongoing basis. Um, I think the staff direction also talked about dedicated revenues, and just this is again the finance speak, but I think it's important is that the city's practice has not been to dedicate revenues to specific um, expenses. I've used this example on a number of times with many of you where I think the city of San Francisco tells me something like a third of their general fund budget is now restricted and it's restricted because they are initiative and referendum state and so if somebody wants dedicated revenues to the zoo then they pass a referendum if they want dedicated revenues for trails if they want dedicated revenues for animal care control then that gets passed and it eliminates a great deal of flexibility um, for you as an elected body to make changes over time as the world changes, right? So philosophically, we live in Minnesota. Thankfully, we have a state which does not have that type of active um, initiative and referendum, and we generally have flexibility on how we use general fund monies. Um, certainly, the state has limited some of our uh, our revenues, um, specifically I call out some of the examples, tax increment financing, certain business licenses, our utility user fees are all um, restricted on the types of things it can be used for. Um, but our general revenues, we have not made that choice. We do dedicate expenditures and the um, 2016 Parks and Streets is an example of that. By ordinance, we've dedicated a certain level of expenditure on parks and streets. But that's an ordinance that could be changed with a public hearing through a process for the council. So we as staff, um, not just because it makes our lives easier, but partly because we think flexibility for you as an elected body is important where we talk about just would change the language to say dedicated expenditures rather than dedicated revenues. So to answer specifically the um, staff direction, there are really only two large sources of revenue which we have where the city could redirect an increase to uh, 
affordable housing funding. The first is property taxes. We as a city levy, three hundred uh, proposal from the mayor is $349 million in property taxes. Next year as a city, that includes the park board levy, that includes our debt levies, it includes pension levies. Um, there is a, a levy that is in special law that is currently not utilized. Um, it goes back to the MCDA d days, and that's a 595 levy. Um, that is a special levy. The only thing, it would still be counted under the city's overall general levy increase. The only thing that, is, that makes it treated differently is it's a separate line item on your people's tax bills. Um, so it's a special taxing jurisdiction, but it's still within the city's levy. The city, as I said, on occasion has used that in the past, um, and that has some restrictions to it, but very general restrictions associated with MCDA powers. Okay. Otherwise, we have the city's general levy. Um, the second area, we have about $34 million a year proposed for franchise fees. Those do have some upper limit because they're supposed to be tied to the amount of money related to um, our utility and gas. Uh, this is primarily utility and gas franchise fees. I'm eliminating discussion of cable franchise in this particular case. Um, the only, I think we saw an increase last year for franchise fees. Again, the, that was viewed as for a reason, but those funds are not dedicated to um, uh, uh, renewable energy efforts, but certainly that was an impetus for that increase to occur. And just remember that it's one of the few ways that the city can actually decide which sector of our economy bears more or less of a fee or a tax burden. The state for property taxes tells us how we can tax, right? But in the franchise fees, you can vary the fee by residential, commercial, industrial, um, or large users or small users. And I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the idea of the fact that we, we can also free up money by reducing expenditures someplace else, which I know is a difficult conversation, but certainly always something that we should be talking about generally. So that's it. I mean, in terms of what is out there, we are limited on how much we can charge in sales taxes by the state, um, so we don't have the opportunity of just arbitrarily inc increasing sales taxes. Many of our fees are, um, are limited. We certainly are always looking for an opportunity um, with the new economy for other revenue sources, but those are usually, again, tied to some kind of impact on our infrastructure or on our staff or, or something um, in that nature. There are certainly abilities that we are always exploring for new revenue sources, but it's, it's, um, we are a, a child of the state of Minnesota in terms of how we can raise revenues for the, for the most part. I think the other part of the staff direction that was asked was, is there an advantage of having affordable housing within an enterprise fund? And just a reminder that enterprise in this case is an accounting term. Um, we typically have most of our activities in a general fund. We also have special revenue funds, which the convention center is a special revenue fund, um, uh, certain parts of the police department and our affordable housing trust fund, we moved into a special revenue fund and then we have an enterprise funds. Enterprise funds are business types operations where you're actually charging usually people, businesses or individuals um, for using a particular service or a particular good or service. And so examples of big enterprise funds within the city are the parking fund, sewer water, storm water, um, uh, refuse and recycling. Uh, so we don't see any advantages of putting affordable housing into an enterprise fund. It doesn't necessarily afford any more protection of that funding. Most of the protections that are in our enterprise funds, for example, in water are afforded by state law and not necessarily the designation as enterprise funds. We do think a special revenue fund is an appropriate place because it separates it out from the regular city operations and those funds can be carried over from year to year without any kind of special council action. So. That's my not very interesting part of this conversation, but if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them before I turn it over to Ms. Bergman to talk about the Homes for All. Um, I just had one small comment on your earlier slide. It reminded me that I think we actually have something in the charter that talks about public art funding and that we have to um, fund uh, like 1.5% of our debt bonds has to go to public art, which is an interesting way to dedicate some amount of funds that wasn't listed. Um, so, yes, Mr. Chair, you you are correct. Yes, um, Councilmember Schrader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Um, Mr. Hope, just want to thank you for the effort you put into this. I brought this forward because I think we really have to have a, a, a real dis transparent discussion about how we fund affordable housing. We're in this housing crisis now because of uh, a lack of funding and a lack of dedication the decades previous. And so my, what I'm concerned about is how do we not repeat this? How do we start to dig out? How do we create a, a new reality for the, the city going forward? Um, and that's why I was curious about a dedicated source of funding. Like we are always gonna need um, affordable housing um, as a kind of an infrastructure. Um, and as we've heard, you know, all of the programs like just for um, creating new units, and I'm sure that's the same for pres preservation as well, the, the limiting factors resources. And if we were able to do more, uh, we'd be able to preserve more houses, we'd be able to offer more affordability, uh, we'd be uh, able to kind of secure affordability as one kind of a stable thing for living in the city. Um, but we also can't do this alone. You know, we have to look toward the state and the county and their funding. And I. I I uh, appreciate looking into this because I'm, I'm curious, but what can we do as we try to balance um, the, the need for consistency to know uh, for our building, for our departments that, that work on production, work on preservation, that they will consistently have this much in the budget, um, as well as know that, you know, it has to be a balance that we cannot, inc we alone cannot just tax our citizens to, to pay for that. It, it's something of how can we lead to push push the state and the county to invest with us and be partners um, to create more affordable housing. So I guess I don't have a question, but I just want to really appreciate the work you've done on this on top of everything else we're mm -hmm. really working on affordable housing. Sure, and Mr. Chair, if it's okay, I'll turn it over to Sasha Bergman then to talk, I think, the last part of the staff direction on just on Council Member Schrader's theme of what are the other parties involved in the Homes for All Coalition and the city's role in that. So Excellent, thank you very much. Okay. Welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Sasha Bergman with the Intergovernmental Relations Department. I'm pleased to be here today uh, to talk about the, the third part of that staff direction, which is about uh, opportunities to work with the Homes for All Coalition uh, to expand application of funding tools for housing. Um, so just maybe to back up a second, the Homes for All Coalition is a statewide uh, coalition of organizations, I think more than 200 organizations at this point, including the city of Minneapolis. Um, that work to advance uh, housing initiatives at the state level in sort of a unified voice. The coalition was established, I think, in 2011, really for different entities to come together around one um, or, or multiple but um, unified uh, requests of the legislature in, in hopes of uh, being successful in, in getting funding. Uh, so we do uh, participate in the Homes for All Coalition and the policy uh, policy committee that meets to discuss new ideas and appreciate CFED Housing's uh, expertise and assistance on helping us provide feedback to that uh, group and also um, our existing legislative platform which helps to inform our advocacy at the Homes for All Coalition. Um, Many of the things that the coalition has advocated for in the past are in alignment with the policies that the city has uh, adopted, um, and so uh, it's very cohesive in that way. Um, right now, the Homes for All Coalition is actually meeting this week, uh, the Tuesday of this week, Friday, uh, this coming Friday, and then um, Tuesday next week to hear, I think, more than 40 proposals that have been brought forward by different organizations that are members of the coalition about uh, state initiatives that could be proposed for the 2019 legislative session. Um, and, you know, at this point, um, I think there are probably several that would be of interest to the city, but m the work of the Homes for All Coalition is really on statewide initiatives that help um, sort of on a, on a higher level or more broadly and not necessarily specific initiatives um, throughout the state. I think one that, that may come up that, that was supported last year by the coalition was a state match for local housing trust funds, and so that's something that might be of particular interest to this committee. Um, and can continue to keep you apprised of, of what is occurring at that uh, body and we'll, we'll continue to participate in that over the next uh, couple of days and then the coming weeks when the full coalition adopts their agenda. And I'm happy, I'm happy to answer any questions. I, I don't see any other comments or questions then, so I believe that I can receive and file this large and complex report. Um, on that motion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, that motion carries. And seeing no further business before us, this meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everybody. And so, and we'll I, I might have missed it.